This week's INPI, it's Amphenol. It's from Amphenol Advanced Sensors. We um, we we featured them like two years ago for their infrared temperature sensors, and uh, this week we're, we're I'm sliding over slightly, and I'm going to talk about um, a CO2 sensor that they just released. I just saw it on Digikey.com/new. It is the T6793. There's two versions. There's the 2K and the 5K. PPM module. It's a beautiful gold sensor. This is a NDIR uh, CO2 sensor. Um, very handy and very timely. It's a good time to release NDIR CO2 sensors. Why is that? Oh, sorry. Here's the, the details about it. Um, you can see it next to a pencil. It's very compact, uh, very small. I think Tel Air is the sub brand um, that makes this, and it's a nicely calibrated CO2 sensor um, with a lot of different output modes, which is kind of neat. CO2, it's everywhere. It's in everything we breathe. We um, like to exhale CO2 and inhale oxygen and plants do the opposite. We live on this planet. Um, CO2 levels have been going up a little bit uh, over time, which is uh, you know, one of the uh, issues we have with uh, climate change in, on this planet. So monitoring CO2 is something that scientists do a lot. Um, but recently, in the last couple of years, more people care about CO2 because it's an excellent way to um, determine the ventilation of uh, indoor spaces. You know, outside air is uh, 400 ppm, basically. And indoor, you know, it starts at 400 if you have the windows open, but if the windows are closed and you're breathing and there's a lot of people and you're in a classroom and there's not a lot of, you know, um, outside air circulation because there's no ventilation, um, CO2 level will start to rise, rise, rise. Uh, so, you know, we've made projects with CO2 monitors like this one Carter did, um, which is, you know, got this adorable cabin and some trees in the background, showing that the indoor CO2 level is 782. As long as it's under 1,000, you're pretty good to go. Um, you know, we had one developer uh, who was working on a CO2 project and they were showing off their readings and it was like 2,000. Plus, and I was like, hey, you know, like, you want to open the window. And I think um, DigiKey also came by. They built their project and they're like, wow, the basement needs more ventilation. So it, it's good to know because it can make you a little drowsy, um, as well as it means that there might not be enough air circulation if you want to reduce, uh, you know, uh, flu or COVID um, transmission um, because there's just not enough air circulation to keep the air moving around. Um, we have sensors in the store like this ENS 160, um, and they're a lot less expensive, uh, you know, the, the effective CO2 sensors. But um, these, I just want to, you know, make sure people know that there's two kinds of sensors for CO2. There's like true NDIR CO2 sensors, which are kind of expensive. They're like 50 bucks plus. And then there's the effective CO2 sensors. And this, you know, if it says eCO2, what it means is it's actually a sensor that uses uh, MOX, volatile organic compound sensing elements. It's a resistive, it's a doped uh, material that when volatile organic compounds um, are you know, nearby, it changes the resistance and you can tell if there's um, gases uh, or volatile organic compounds, so like ethanols and stuff. And you know, by measuring that, you can sort of kind of use it to estimate uh, air quality and um, the effect of CO2. So here you see this eCO2 um, reading of about you know 700 ppm, which is again, if we're indoors, it's, that's about right. The only thing is this isn't a true CO2 sensor. It's again, it's estimating it based on um, overall volatile organic compounds in the air. Whereas um, this sensor, uh, the T6793, is a true NDIR uh, infrared sensor. It uses um, how IR light is affected by CO2 concentration. It's calibrated uh, to give you a really good precision, accurate reading. Um, so this one, it has you know really good uh, temperature dependence and accuracy, plus or minus 45 ppm, plus 3% of reading, which is really great. You can always calibrate it to be even better. There's a built-in algorithm that if this is being used for outdoor reading or um, readings indoor where there will eventually that you know have an open window so that the um, minimal co2 ppm is 400 it will like recalibrate because it does drift a little bit over time 
Um, the module is quite small, shown on the overhead, which I really like. And um, there's a lot of interfaces, which I thought was kind of like the powerful, the, the, the size and the interface is what kind of sets this module apart, as well as, of course, the accuracy. Um, so it has a six pin uh, IO header. Um, you can see uh, there's a typo, I think it's the ones, it's TX SDA, I think it's RX SCL. So there's uh, power and ground, which you want to give it five volts, which is not uncommon. You need, you know, 200 milliamps for the sensor peak, about 100 um, average. There's control test, PWM output, UART output, um, and I squared C output. Oh, and sorry, can you uh, just get that out of order? Okay. So the first step that I thought was interesting was PWM. So there's two modes of PWM. There's a one kilohertz, and I think there's like a 10 kilohertz version. Um, which I think was, thought was really neat. So if you have a sensor that doesn't have an analog input, maybe doesn't even have I squared C, but it can read PWM pulse width, you can use that. Um, it'll always go low for two milliseconds, high for two milliseconds, and then um, you can calculate the PPM based on the PWM width. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, you know, I don't have any sensors offhand. I don't have any microphones offhand that don't have UART or I squared C, but do have PWM, but you know, if you're dealing with, um, there's some legacy systems that use old style sensors, uh, this can be used in those places. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, 11, this is, 11, I, 11. yeah, then we'll go back. So yeah. I squared C. So this is, um, you know, my favorite interface. So you can use, uh, you know, Modbus I squared C registers. You, you write addresses and then you can read uh, versions. So the firmware, the PPM, um, reset device, so you know, basic stuff, uh, the ABC logic enable disable, that's the um, auto calibration based on if it's outdoor enough to, or getting low enough measurements, it'll eventually reach 400 uh, PPM. Uh, you can measure on demand for lower current, or you can, of course, have it be in continuous mode and get measurements every five seconds. So, you know, I like I squared C, but that's the second option. And then um, the third option is UART, and they also have RS-485 transceiver support, which I thought was like really smart because a lot of people do want to have the sensor far away. They want to use RS-485 um, to do, you know, a differential um, signal from far away. I squared C doesn't work for far away. I wouldn't use PWM for long distance, but 485, you know, yeah, why not? As long as you give it good power. So um, plain UART, I think 9600 baud or RS-485. So that's that's all good. So again, most CO2 sensors don't have all those options. They have maybe one or two. Um, I like that there is uh, on this one, there's you know four or five different ways you can connect to it. There is some code that I found on GitHub. It's a little old, it's for earlier versions, but I think the register maps are the same um, using I squared C for uh, their sensor. That said, you know, the protocol is pretty simple. I think, you know, you would read this code, you'd look at the data sheet, the app note um, with the I2C instructions, and, you, and they have example pseudocode in the app note for I2C as well. So that's the sensor, so I thought Available I would- Available on DigiKey. It's in stock. It's one of those things that you can actually get at the time of this printing, by printing I mean screenshot and sending photons, um, there is 999 in stock. Yes, so maybe we can show it on the overhead because I want to show. It's much smaller than I expected. I really thought yeah. that this would be larger. A lot of CO2 sensors are quite big. That looks gigantic on the screen. It looks, well, it's a really good photo. It's like, ooh, golden. But it's actually, yeah. uh, you know, very tiny. Um, it's like a miniature satellite. Yeah, and then this is the, the IO, and then this is a little my controller that does the readings and interfacing for you. Um, but it's a very cute little sensor, and I like that, you know, it's... Um, through a hole and there's, you know, um, you can put uh, headers on both sides. So you can just have it plug into your system because these only last, they're not meant to last more than, you know, maybe five, 10, 15 years before maybe they have to be pulled or, you know, they can get contaminated, um, especially if they're in a, in a caustic environment. Uh, so they're easy to replace. And that is this week's INMPI. Hi, INMPI.